Hello everyone, welcome to Wall Street for Main Street Podcast. My name is Mo, and today the returning guest, we had him on a couple of months ago, but due to popular demand, we have him back on again, uh, Eric Heidek. Uh He is the editor of Inside Track and 40 Year Cycle. Eric, thank you for coming back. Oh, thanks for having me back, Mo. It's uh, my pleasure. All right, I want to start off this podcast by talking about uh, something that you cover pretty well in your newsletter, and that's the gold and silver market. Uh, now, you last time we talked, you expected a correction after we hit our 50-week high in the gold and silver market. Silver was up as high as $21.20 just about, and it went down to almost $18.47. And then gold went up as high as thirteen seventy seven. now, and then it went down to almost around 1300 um, So we hit our highs in June and early July, as you expected. So what do you expect to see to happen for the next few months and on to, to, on to 2017? Excuse me. Well, um, you know, to, to give some context for that, let me just step back real quickly and, and give the, um, the overview that I am expecting for this time period, uh, kind of a broader stroke uh, expectation. And I've thought all along, it's what I've published since 2013, 2014, uh, but that gold and silver would bottom in late 2015 that they would see an initial approximate six-month surge to begin 2016, and that then they would see a consolidation phase probably for the remainder of 2016, uh, setting an important secondary low uh, later in 2016. And so that would be kind of like your your initial advance and your initial pullback on a uh, multi-year basis. And then from there, we would see a more sustained, a more convincing bull market in 2017, 2018, and probably beyond that. So that has been the governing uh, longer-term cycle expectation all along. And, you know, in, in late 2015, I was having as many people tell me, no way it can, it can suddenly surge from here. And in mid-2016, um, a couple of months ago when we were talking, I was having just as many tell me, no, no, gold and silver are going to the moon. There's all these reasons that they just have to keep skyrocketing. Uh, but everything technically, cyclically, and even fundamentally was saying, no, we've seen the extent of our initial surge. Uh, we've gotten, you know, ex- exerted some ba- pain on the bears, and we've gotten the bulls. Uh, overly enthusiastic, so it's time for a a good correction and a good consolidation phase. And as you just pointed out, that's that's exactly what we've seen. Um, and you know, there's there's been some uh, very specific trading signals that then start to hone that outlook and and really give me specific places to uh, buy and sell gold and silver, where to get out of those positions. And that was what really confirmed it for me in early July when my work triggered a sell signal in gold, uh, something I published for all of my subscribers, uh, very specific. And uh, so that was confirming to me that um, that the, a, a, an intermediate top was taking place. And then in early August, when uh, both gold and silver rebounded to slightly lower highs, then silver triggered a similar sell signal right in the beginning of August. And and then the XAU and gold stocks followed shortly after that with a, a sell signal as well. So those specific technical and trading signals were what filter my cycle analysis and say, okay, now's the time to act. And uh, the the outlook from there was to see a sharp drop into the very end of August and the um, the downside targets that pu- were published were at 1308 in gold and right around the 1800 level, 18 dollar level in silver. And we just hit those, and we just bottomed on August 31st. So it's looking like that aspect of the outlook has been fulfilled, and now it's on to the next phase. Now I, I've done videos on technical analysis for our 
followers, and I always tell them that you always want to see a uh, in a bull market, you always want to see the market uh, tap their brakes a little and then consolidate and have a little correction before they continue on uh, moving up. Uh, so I think that's what we're seeing right now, just a tap and a break in the break in a bull market in gold and silver. Well, it, and it's all the, – the thing is you need to put that into uh, proper proportion because uh, really I think Elliott Wave analysis probably describes it best – but there are so many different levels or degrees of those advances and corrections that you don't want to mix apples with oranges. And so, okay, gold has been in a bull market for all of six months, uh, if you're talking about the last five years. And it had such a significant rally compared to any previous rallies of the last five or six years that it does take some time. And even if the correction is not that deep from a price perspective, uh, there are certain time-based indicators that need to catch up to uh, this advance before gold and silver have their best chance of catapulting to, to new highs. And some of those indicators have not yet caught up. And so from a timing perspective, I think that there is still more volatile two-sided action expected before we really get another sustained advance. So I agree with you that it does need to uh, put on the brakes and, and see some consolidation, but it's critical to know where you are in a bull or bear market as well. And when you're in the early stages, that that setback, that tapping the brakes is often uh, exponentially larger than and longer than a correction uh, after the market has begun to enter more of its parabolic advance. And I don't think we're anywhere near that in gold and silver, which is why I think that this consolidation uh, could stretch out through uh, the majority of the second half of 2016 before you really start to uh, prepare for another breakout move to the upside. Now, I'm, I've been only been following your newsletter for the past couple months. Uh, were you able to pinpoint a, the correction in gold and silver when it happened back in 2011, 2012, it, I think? Yeah, what – um, I had a series of uh, reports and articles that I did in 2011. In fact, they're still posted on our website, and uh, they were called uh, Date with Destiny and uh, Golden Age. And I was explaining why from longer-term cycles, but also from uh, some uh, near-term and intermediate work that was developing in, in 2011, why we should see a major multi-year top uh, right around the 40-year anniversary of the Nixon gold shock. And that wasn't the only reason. In fact, it was really just one of a myriad of, of reasons, and both technically and cyclically, and also fundamentally, uh, why I was expecting that and why I was uh, I started triggering sell signals in late July of uh, 2011, and and then stronger sell signals in late August, early September of 2011, and they're all published, documented. They're still out there um, in in what in our archived reports. So you don't have to believe me; you can go and read it. But everything was shaping up for a major top. And like I said, I've been explaining this 40-year cycle, which to me has just been uncanny. And you can go back a couple hundred years, but just going to the last three or four phases when we were coming into 2011, you go back to um, the 18, early 1890s, and you had what was called the, the Billion Dollar Congress and this just um, an overabundant spending, kind of like we saw in, in recent years. And it ended up leading to a, a bubble and a crash in gold and silver in the early 1890s. And then 40 years later, uh, 1931 was when the first real um, shock against gold occurred when Britain went off the gold standard and 
And then the U.S. in 1933 was when gold was outlawed and confiscated. But you had that 40-year period almost very precisely from 1891 to 1931. And then 40 years later, 1971, you had the Nixon gold shock took place in August where Nixon slammed shut the gold window, stopped convertibility of gold for international uh, clients. And that had an impact through the entire 1970s. Everything that followed that from the collapse of Bretton Woods in 73 to the Jamaica Agreement in 76 and just the inflationary skyrocketing in the late 1970s uh, was all, to me, a, a repercussions and ramifications of that gold shock of 1971. And as we were coming into 2011, I was in detail kind of describing this bigger macroeconomic uh, structure and cycle and explaining why uh, the anniversary of that gold shock was probably going to see another shift in dollar-gold relationship. And this time it would be a shift from a 12-year bull market in gold into a multi-year uh, correction in gold and a – I, I described it then and and continued to through 2013 what I thought would be a bubble bursting in silver and that's pretty much what we saw going from 48 49 dollars an ounce in 2011 down to under 14 dollars an ounce in 2015 so it was all in this this same bigger picture cycle scenario and and once again it's something that I believe is going to lead to a very inflationary period in the towards the end of this decade. Um, and if you go back to the 1970s, it was really from 76 through 81 when you saw all of the ramifications of that and what it did to the dollar as well. And I think that we're poised and, and primed for something similar, although history, you know, it, it rhymes, but it doesn't exactly repeat what's happened in the past. But you see a lot of things set up and structured for a similar inflationary move, uh, price inflation, that is, in uh, 2016 through 2021. And so, so yes, the, the cycles and the technical work was very specifically uh, looking at a major top in, in 2011, a multi-year top. And then from there is when, uh, after the initial drop in 2013, was when I started describing 2016 as what I expected would be the golden year and was warning readers to hold off until then before really starting to get bullish on gold again. So when you published that uh, newsletter back in 2011, what was the reaction that you got from people? Were there any pushbacks, especially from the gold and silver bug? Could they get a little sensitive when they hear about Absolutely, and I've gotten, I was getting pushback all through 2011 through late 2015 that each time I'd, I'd talk about, okay, we saw a good, sharp rebound, now it's time for another wave down. Uh, all I'd hear is the the same reasons of why gold and silver had to go to the moon, had to explode. And, you know, eventually I agree with those, the fundamental arguments, but that's the huge weakness of fundamentals. They don't give you specific timing. About the only time you can really get specific timing from fundamentals is after they have already hit the market, everyone knows them, a market has reacted, uh, but when you're anticipating a fundamental factor, uh, that anticipation can go on for years as it has. And e even now, when I was talking about a, a three to six month top in the middle of 2016, uh, I got a lot of pushback. And and so, as, as you put it, there's definitely a, a sensitivity there because um, they're kind of holding – and often there's a an inherent conflict of interest. There may be some that are not only holding 
gold and silver, but trying to push others to buy gold and silver from them. Well, that's, um, you know, that kind of distorts your, your perspective. And again, I'm not saying that the, that the arguments are invalid because most of them, I believe, are very valid. But timing is the real critical thing. And that's where uh, I'm such an advocate of technical analysis because it really helps you hone that timing. Yeah, and then technical analysis is very good for when you want to uh, determine entry and ex exit point for any investment that you have. Uh, I I agree with you. If anybody does fundamental analysis when they buy or sell stocks or or so on, they should also have some technical analysis background so they can see what's going on with the price history and so you're not buying when the uh, market is overbought or when you're not selling when a market is oversold. So, yeah, I agree with you. Well, and, and one, of, one of the things, too, about technical analysis that I think that your, uh, your naysayers and your detractors keep, I think where they get stuck is they think that all you're doing is looking at lines on a chart. And that would be like saying that a cardiologist is just looking at lines at a chart when he gets a printout of, you know, an EKG or, or one of the other tests that they run. And all it is, is, is lines on a chart. Well, it's what those lines represent. It's not just, you know, up and down squiggles on a piece of paper. Those squiggles are representing something and they're revealing to you with price action what often what some of your bigger uh, movers and shakers in the market are doing uh, what a specific market is doing as far as either just consolidating or perhaps building a base and building a bottom and, and there's a lot of things that it represents it's not just lines on a chart in, in fact that's that's the the least of what it is and but but often I get that argument well how can you just look at you know a pattern or or this and expect it to repeat and you know it's kind of like saying you can't really see the wind or gravity but when you see what it does to uh, visible entities and you see that happen over and over and over again you know what influences it's exerting and, and what impact it's having and you begin to realize that there are similarities and and they're they're pretty constant so it's it's more of what it represents not just uh what you're seeing you know it's the, the detractors it's, it's kind of like when you're uh trying to uh point to something to a dog and the dog keeps looking at your finger and you're, you're trying to you know, convince the dog, no, I'm pointing to that ball I just threw over there, and all the dog looks at is the finger. And it's like, no, that there's something being represented here, something being pointed to, um, and and that's often lost in the debate. And that's a great point. Now, I, I don't know if you thought about this, but I'm going to ask you anyways. How, do you think there's going to be any uh, difference between the bull market we have now in gold and silver than the one we had pre-2011? Yes, and if if only for the mere fact that um, there is a principle in in the markets and in waves of um, of diversity, and you don't see the same type of move that close in time. You know, maybe you can go back a couple hundred years and find a an analogous period where. Uh, precious metals moved very similarly, but you very rarely see the same thing twice. And one of those reasons is because you've gotten farther along in a cycle. And even if I take the word cycle out of that, because that's, you know, I know that uh, my detractors, that, that's kind of a incendiary word to them. So if you just look at the whole macroeconomic structure. We've gone farther down the line now than where we were in the late 90s and early 2000s. And there's less 
um, there's less room for error, error from a uh, global governmental, economic, and financial uh, position. And uh, it's bound to be a, um, a more uh, erratic but also sharp uh, move, both up and the reactions back down, because you've come farther down the line in getting close to a full-blown crisis. And even when you look at the, the economic uh, structure through not only through our country, but through Europe and, and others, you know, you've got uh, a from an employment and that part of the economy standpoint, you've still got a lot of struggles and weakness. So interest rates continue to hover at historic lows. But you've got signs of price inflation just starting to creep in in different pockets. And I think that if we get a a little bit of a um, commodity shock, which is what I'm expecting beginning in 2017, all of a sudden you're going to have a real uh, dilemma for uh, Janet Yellen and, and all of your other financial um uh, movers and shakers and, and central bankers uh, where they can't push up rates too much to try and stem inflation because it would just collapse an economy, uh, but they can't keep them too low when uh, when this price inflation is starting to take hold again. And so when gold and silver react to that, and there's another reason why I think they'll react, not just inflationary. Um, when they react, I think it is going to be much sharper and more accelerated than what we saw, except maybe if you're looking at uh, the final year or two uh, from 2010 into mid-2011 when things really went more parabolic for gold and silver. Yeah, when silver went almost to $50 and gold went, I think, above 1900 Yep, that was think. above 1900 yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in, in that market uh, for the final couple months in 2016 onward to 2017. So uh, we'll, you know, probably talk about it again near, before the end of the year. But I want to shift gears here and talk about uh, the euro crisis, which is something you've been writing about in your newsletter. A lot of talk about what's happening with the euro banks. Uh, a lot of them are close but probably already insolvent, despite the central bank printing $180 billion per month to prevent any shock uh, in the you know euro econ the EU econ uh, economy. Excuse me. So, what do you see happening there, and why do you think a crisis is near uh, in the euro? Well, again, I'd, I'd have I'd want a quick step back to big picture scenario, and I have. Uh, for over a decade, documented some very longer term cycles, going back hundreds and hundreds of years, and and then coming down to the last century, and then kind of multi-decade cycles, multi-year cycles. And everything was showing to me that uh, 2018 to 2021 should be a kind of a momentous period uh, when it comes to what I just termed as, as unification cycles. And funny enough, uh, from different analysis I did, I was reaching similar conclusions where Europe was concerned and also where the Middle East and Arab nations were concerned. So I don't know if those two things are going to meld together um, or if they're, they're two distinct things. But my conclusion has been that uh, we would see in 2018 through 2021 a, a renewed push for a different unification than what has been going on right now. And with that big picture outlook, a lot of my work was showing me that from 2010, 2011 into 2018, we would see just the opposite that you would see uh, recurring crises in Europe and that you would see a period of disunification uh, through it, that there would be a lot of struggles with the initial attempt at the European Union and the Euro itself. 
and that I thought that beginning in 2014, that crisis stage would begin to accelerate. And and then again, even enter another phase in 2016, 2017. And I know we talked about this in our, our previous uh, discussion, and I've been writing about it for the last year or two, but there was this just uncanny eight-year cycle that was impacting uh, Britain and the UK and, and the British pound in particular. And without fail, every eight years going back to 1968, uh, the pound would just go through a period of being completely pummeled. And that's what I was looking for in 2016 and why I was discussing why I thought Brexit would occur and that that would be one of those things that created a bit of a panic. Uh, but you would get an initial downward re reaction on the news, and but then a delayed reaction uh, later on down the line. And that, I think, is just one more straw uh, on the on the camel's back of uh, European Union, and as you mentioned, there's been this uh, recurring and and uh, accelerating crisis with a lot of banks. You go back just this year, you've had revelations back in April and May where a lot of Spain's banks uh, just took a complete nosedive. And there was a big court ruling about the floor clauses with mortgages that is uh, alleged to – the expectations are that that's going to cost the, the Spanish banks billions of euros uh, needing to be uh, refunded to uh, deceived mortgage applicants. Uh, and then uh, at the same time, May and June, you had new revelations about uh, Italian banks and the $360 billion of non-performing loans. Uh, and then Portugal, uh, you started getting more revelations that they're getting an increasing uh, crisis with non-performing loans. And you've just got, as I was describing, I see the potential for a perfect storm, that right now these are separate fronts, you know, in Spain, in Italy, in Portugal, now Britain and Brexit uh, creating uncertainty and, and more of a shock wave through Europe. And it's not necessarily Britain and Brexit itself, but it's what that is – already doing to the mindset of a lot of other European nations that have been pretty much 50-50 split as to whether to stick with the EU or to try and have a referendum and, and lead the EU. And Brexit just gave a big license or encouragement to a lot of those other nations to start pursuing that uh, objective more aggressively. So you've got all these different fronts, kind of like different weather systems occurring, and but they're coming closer and closer together, and there's this serious risk of them merging into one perfect storm, which is what I think that you are likely to see in 2017, 2018. And that would just fit perfect with the big picture scenario that I've outlined where I thought that the EU and the euro would get pushed to the brink of of disaster or uh, breakup, and that that is what would ultimately spur a different form of unification coming into the end of this decade. Because rarely do you get a major unification like that coming voluntarily, but it usually comes as a result of crisis. And, you know, even the, the Treaty of Rome that started all of this was not long, uh, and even the Benelux uh, that preceded the Treaty of Rome, a lot of that was a reaction to World War II. And, you know, Europe seeing two major wars in a 30-year period that almost decimated the, the continent, uh, that's what led to uh, this real push for unification. And I think this time it's going to be an economic uh, crisis that is going to push them to a new form of unity, but that during that crisis phase is when things like gold and silver will do so well.
Yeah, a lot, a lot of concern on what's happening at the uh, in the EU, especially the banks. A lot of them are insolvent because they have a lot of non-performing loans in their portfolio. That uh, pretty much mirrors what happened with the banks here uh, before the 2008 financial crisis, where uh, they have a lot of uh, subprime mortgages in their portfolio, and and a lot of them are default and. A lot of people are not familiar with what the, the housing market in Europe, but uh, when someone defaults, it takes about a it takes a long time for them to actually take over the property and you know put it back out in the market compared to here, where it might happen a little bit quicker. So a lot of uh, potential black swan happening in the EU, and a lot of people are speculating that this could be the black swan, similar to the Lehman and Bear Stearns collapse that we had in the U.S. that you know, broke the camel back and we saw the stock market collapse. Uh, do you see that happening? Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I think you might even be quoting some of the stuff that, that I wrote in Inside Track the last few months uh, that, you know, one of the things that I see as a, a similarity is, you know, in Italy, you know, they're, they're packaging uh, many of these non-performing loans into investor bonds. Well, that's exactly what happened with subprime loans here in the U.S. in the early 2000s. Uh, you know, they'd get they'd get packaged into <clears throat> into one bond or, or one portfolio, and they might start out being sold to sophisticated investors that kind of knew what they were getting into. Although, you know, there's a lot of evidence that that even that was hidden pretty well. Uh, but then, as they um, you know, as they change hands and as your, um, you know, a lot of your pension funds and other things that are managing the the little guy's money uh, all get put into these uh, bizarre uh, structured uh, bonds and, and portfolios without really understanding the enormous risk that's in there. Uh, so then you're you're spreading this this contagion to right down to um, the everyday man who thinks he's just investing in some sort of bond that's a low risk conservative investment. Uh, but anyway, they're talking about you know all these non performing loans getting packaged into investor bonds, and it's like okay, didn't we just do this a decade ago? Don't we already know what this led to? But I guess Europe's going to give it a try and, you know, see if uh, they can create the same type of uh, collapse that uh, that the U.S. had in 07, 08, 09. And, you know, when you look at here again, you come to the technicals and the charts, I think a perfect illustration, all someone needs to do is pull up a chart of the stock 600, and that's S-T-O-X-X. Um, Stocks Bank 600 index, um, which is what it sounds like, an index of 600 top banks across Europe. And you look at where that has gone in the last 10 years, that that index is uh, 80 to 90 percent down from its, its 2008 peak. But even since just 2014, the index has lost 60 to 70 percent. That is a huge drop over just a couple of years, and and it's it's reflecting what's going on across the landscape in Europe. And you know, then you have a major global institution like the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, come out uh, just recently and express how Deutsche Bank. Uh, they they view as the greatest threat to uh, to global a, a global economic crisis and and you look at the the stock of Deutsche Bank and all of these uh, many of the stocks in uh, of Spain's top banks that are are ninety percent have lost ninety percent of their value in in a few years uh, that is showing you some serious problems even if the masses haven't recognized them, even if they haven't kicked into the all-out contagion phase. Um, it, it's showing that you that you know those banks and uh, that entire economy is uh, right on the edge of of an abyss, and looking over it and 
all it's going to take is a, a strong wind coming up behind them to push them into that abyss. It doesn't doesn't mean it won't happen or that it will happen. doesn't mean that uh, they might not find some additional Band-Aid to delay the inevitable or kick the can a little farther down the road. Uh, there again, that's one of those things where the fundamentals have been making it clear for years what what appears to be on the horizon, but the timing is what's so critical, and, and that's why technical analysis – is so important to me and already that that stocks chart stock 600 chart uh, and the cycles in it are showing to me a very specific time in the coming years when I think the greatest chance of a meltdown is and and so we'll see if that pans out yeah and the central bank is printing tons of money to try to keep those banks uh afloat uh one trillion uh dollars per every six months that they're printing and yet all these European banks are trading most of them are trading below ten dollars even below five dollars so it, it, clearly it's not working um and so that index that you mentioned it that uh what exchange is that trading on uh it's a euro you know I don't have that right in front of me so um so it's not something you could go to, you know, Yahoo Finance and and see the chart for that. You got to go somewhere uh, actually, else. Actually, I I think you could, um, and uh, you know, I'm able to even call it up on websites like uh, BarChart.com, um, and I believe that the symbol is like F A, uh, the, the the futures on it, um, the symbol's F A, and then whatever month you're doing so like if you put in f a u u stands for september f a u one six uh twenty sixteen that would show you a a daily chart of the september stock six hundred uh contract and you could even expand that to weekly monthly charts uh i think that uh, bloomberg business uh you can go in and access charts of um of things like that, that they're good for accessing charts of all your global indices, uh, even like uh, those specific uh, Spanish banks, like it's Banco Popular. I'm probably not saying it exactly correctly, but uh, that's phonetically what it what it looks like. Um, and uh, what's the one in Italy too? Uh, but all of those charts you can uh, access. Through uh, through places like Bloomberg Business and, and other sites out there, uh, so they are pretty easily uh, accessible. And it's a it's a globally recognized index that stocks uh, that's traded by you know a lot of American um, uh, investors and, and portfolio managers. Okay, yeah, I was just asking just in case any any of our listeners want to look at that index. Uh, just want to let them know where, where they can find that uh, the, the chart for that index or any information on, on that index. So I want to uh, also talk about what's going on in the bond market. There's been, there's been a lot of talk about doing negative interest rate here in the United States, but uh, that doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon. But uh, I know other nations are already doing negative interest rate. So I just want to see uh, get your insight on what's going on in the bond market and how negative interest rate could affect the bond market. Well, it's it's kind of like the um, just the governing principle of any bull and bear market that uh, you know you can only go so far. The bears can only you can only go till everyone's bearish, and then there's no no one left to sell. Or in a bull market, you can only go till everyone's bullish, and then there's no one left to buy, which is what drives prices higher or lower. And I see that interest rates and the bond market um, really coming to an extreme. Uh, I've explained why I think 2016 is, again, kind of linked to these much longer-term cycles uh, is the year for uh, an all-out top in the U.S. 30-year bond and even 10-year note uh, contracts uh, which, you know, corresponding low in interest rates. I don't know what the exact economic 
uh, trigger would be to uh, to turn that tide, uh, or if uh, the the rates stay relatively low, even though the perception begins to to change and swing the market. But I think that we are uh, in a major topping process where bonds are concerned, major bottoming process where interest rates are concerned. And, you know, part of that might be um, a, a renewed crisis with fiat currencies. You know, I think that the euro is going to be the one heading the way lower as it has uh, pretty much throughout this decade. From 2011 on, uh, the euro has been the one uh, suffering the, the sharpest declines and in the, the bear market. And so the dollar has looked relatively strong, uh, but I think that fiat currencies in general are going to continue to struggle. And one of the um, one of the parts of ammunition that a, a central bank has to try and shore up a currency when it's really into that crisis stage is uh, interest rates and. So, you know, it may be something that if you see what I'm expecting in the next couple of years, a renewed inflationary environment, and again, I think that that's going to be more price inflation, not a whole economic inflation, uh, probably brought on by supply issues. I, I discussed why I think that there's a food crisis on the horizon, why there's uh, I think that different commodities are going to have some shocks over the next couple of years, and that could be the thing that gets the snowball rolling down the hill, that then you get uh, gold and silver going along with that, and you get the currencies uh, going farther into the tank, and then all of a sudden you've got central banks thinking, okay, again, you know, can't raise the rates because of the economic structure, but can't lower them or leave them here because uh, need something to attract investors into particular currency. And so there's just this whole um, kind of complicated scenario that I see unfolding over the next three to five years that could change the perspective on a lot of these topics. And it's just like you know, it's like when you came to the end of the 90s and for eight, ten years, central banks had been selling gold. Every time gold had a, a little bit of a bounce, central banks were selling it. And I went on record back in 99 and 2000 describing why I thought we were going to see a decade-long uh, advance in gold. And all I kept hearing was, no, that's impossible. Central banks are going to keep selling it. They're never going to let gold rally, because what would it do to the currency? Well, we're in a similar situation with interest rates now. And it's, you know, there's no way it can change until suddenly there is a way that it has to change. And usually that fundamental is a surprise, and usually the markets and the charts and the technicals have been warning about it for months or even a couple of years beforehand and starting to show uh, what's happening, and, and that's what I see right now in the markets, that they are warning of a, a major bottom in interest rates, uh, which I expect in 2016. Now, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden uh, they go from a 30-year bear market in interest rates to suddenly a, a full-blown bull market in a year or two, but it does mean that you turn the corner and that uh, market perception begins to turn and you start to see uh, quicker rallies in interest rates or drops in the corresponding bond market uh, as that perception begins to shift. And that's a lot of imp implication on other parts of the economy like the housing market and the credit market because any rise in interest rate it's going to affect the housing market because a lot of people are buying houses to take advantage of a low interest rate that's out there right now. Yeah, and you know if they've got uh, locked in 30-year rates, then uh, they're they're relatively safe. Uh, yeah. if, if you've got your variables, although you know again since the collapse of 07, 08, 09, uh, there's been a lot of uh, 
greater restrictions on stuff like that. But yeah, I agree that it could certainly have a uh, dampening effect on uh, the real estate recovery. And um, but again, this is this will probably take a few years to flesh out where the interest rates are concerned, but I think you're going to start seeing uh, more volatility, which is uh, indicative of a, a major shift that, again, you don't go straight in from a downtrend into an uptrend. You get a lot of bottoming phase where you see a quick, sharp rally and then an equally sharp sell-off and repeat that multiple times as as the bulls and bears get into a, a death struggle uh, trying to control the market. Now, there's one commodity that we haven't talked about yet, and it's a very important commodity because uh, our life kind of depends on it, and that's the oil, the oil market. Um, so right now, the oil is at $44. It's pretty much been trading sideways uh, this year, uh, ever since it had that big drop last year which surprised a lot of people. I uh, just want to get your stop on the oil market. And were you surprised to see that big uh, drop we saw in the oil market last year? No, no. I had um, a, a whole series of articles that I did on uh, oil and why mid-2014 was the latest phase of a, a very consistent three-year cycle that had been timing uh, descending highs in crude and that um, that from there, from mid 2014, I thought we were going to have the sharpest sell-off, and that it should last into early 2016, which I still think is probably the major bottom. But not to sound like a broken record, but that same mentality that when you go from such a bear market like that, even though the bottom may take hold, uh, you know, let's say it took hold in early 2016, uh, a full-blown bull market still might be a year or 18 months out from now. It takes a long time for the fundamental repercussions of that drop from $105, $110 a barrel in crude down to below $30. Uh, and, and as you point out, it still hasn't really recovered that much from that from the lows of early 2016, that is, uh, you know, just like when the real estate market collapsed, it takes years for the the consequences of that and all of the uh, ramifications to, uh, to to flush out and flush out through a market before you're in a position where a a new sustained bull market can take place and what I'm looking for is a another similar low in early 2017. Uh, ideally, it will be a little bit above where the major lows are, but I can't completely uh, eliminate the possibility for a, a retest of that low or even a brief spike below it. But I think that from that point, uh, from early 2017 on, then the market will start to become more favorable to a, a more sustained bull market. And that that's what I think we'll see start to take hold in 2017 and 2018. But for the rest of 2016, I think that, uh, that crude just has too much weighing on it and that we're just going to see this volatile trading range where it tries to get up to 55 or 60 and is, is quickly repelled and and then works itself back down uh, below that forty dollar a barrel level uh, repeatedly. Yeah, ever since the oil market has uh, dropped, we saw a lot of uh, oil nation completely collapse, uh, especially uh, in South America and Venezuela. Uh, somewhat, uh, a little bit in Brazil. I mean, they're not a oil nation like Venezuela is, but uh, we've seen a lot of negative impact that it has on those countries, and also in Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, they're starting to invest in other industries to uh, minimize their uh, the impact the low oil prices is having on in their economy, and even in the U.S. when the um, uh, the uh, horizontal drilling uh, or fracking 
oil industry uh, when with, uh, on a rise, and then we had the collapse, and then that had an impact on that industry as well. Well, there's a lot of speculation that you know Saudi Arabia certainly as the as the kingpin of the oil market that they had no incentive or motivation to try and stem the uh, that sharp drop in crude prices from mid 2014 and early 2016 because that you know as the fracking industry continued to grow um that posed a a potential threat to uh, OPEC and and Saudi Arabia and but the the big difference is that uh, i believe $60 a barrel crude is kind of the floor for fracking to be making money and as long as crude's under that price uh they're losing money and so it's a disincentive for for fracking and but it takes time for that to really uh make its way through an industry and so as crude stays here below $60 a barrel, and as uh, the fracking industry continues to struggle with these lower prices, you begin to see uh, shutdowns or at least uh, suspensions of a lot of operations. And, you know, from a long-term perspective, that certainly works into Saudi Arabia and, and the stronger players of OPEC work in their favor. So if they do take a little bit of a longer term viewpoint, they had, you know, often in the past when crude is really plummeting, everyone looks to Saudi Arabia to step up and make some sort of uh, innuendo or put out some sort of communique that, uh, okay, they're going to, you know, reduce uh, production um, on a daily basis to to try and get this uh, this drop from accelerating and often that would have the the emotional psychological impact to support crude but you didn't see any of that during that whole 18 month collapse in crude prices and there was even you know if you read some of the geopolitical um, events of 2013 2014 2015 uh, you even see a real struggle between Saudi Arabia and Russia um, uh, going on at that time. And so, once again, Saudi Arabia had no in motivation to, to try and support prices because they also knew that uh, the collapse would would hurt Russia as much as it hurts anybody. And, and there were some struggles that went on um, in 2014 and a little before that between uh, one of the Saudi princes and Vladimir Putin. And so there, there were kind of a couple birds that uh, Saudi Arabia was able to kill with one stone. Even if they didn't cause the crash in prices, they had little incentive to step up and try and stop that collapse. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And also, uh, a lot of the oil nations, their fiscal uh policy is impacted by the low oil prices because a lot of them need oil to be at least a hundred dollars for them to maintain their uh their fiscal budget so that had impacted a lot of the oil producing nation um across the world uh so eric thank you for your time if people want to find out more about your newsletter where can they go they can go to one of two websites our uh flagship website and the one that uh, gives the most details on the specific publications and, and subscriptions is insidetrack.com. That's spelled with an extra I in the middle. So it's I-N-S-I-I-D-E-T-R-A-C-K.com. And then we also have uh, an offshoot of that, the 40yearcycle.com. That's the number four zero and then the words yearcycle.com where a lot of these articles, publications, links to all the interviews and podcasts and, and a lot of other um, analysis that has that I've done on this 40-year cycle over the last decade or more. Uh, they can read a lot of the uh, reports and publications there to get a little better idea of what is influencing my thinking uh, looking ahead from here. So they're the two best locations 
uh, best websites to go to, and then you can contact us through those websites as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you for your time, Eric. Uh, maybe we could have you on in December to give a review of 2016 and maybe a preview of 2017, uh, if you're interested in that. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, I should be available. That would be uh, sounds like a great idea. Okay, great. Well, thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Mo.